All right, well, welcome back to uh, New Thirst Addiction Ministries One Step to Freedom Addiction Recovery Program. Um, I'm like two or three weeks behind. Uh, the last couple of weeks have just been kind of busy. And actually, this I tried to record this <laughs> on uh, Sunday. And uh, when I stopped the video, it never stopped. So I just shut the program down and it stopped the video and everything, you know. Um, and, but it only saved the first 15 minutes of the video. And after 45 minutes, I was pretty frustrated uh, with that. So I quit. But now I've got another 45 minutes to try to get this video done. So here we are. Um, anyway, if this is your first time joining us, this is a um, faith-based addiction recovery program. Uh, believes in one step. That step is putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ uh, to heal you. Um, we believe that once you... Um, have turned over your life and committed your life to Christ, put your trust in him, um, uh, put your trust in Jesus, uh, that you are healed. You are no longer the old man. In fact, the scripture says that you've put off the old man and you've put on the new man, um, which is kind of contrary to some of the 12 step programs. You know that 30 years from now, uh, you'll be walking into a meeting and you will say, uh, hi, my name is Bob and uh, I'm an alcoholic. Uh, when in fact you haven't had a drink for 30 years. You're no longer that person. We believe that you are healed and you no longer identified with your old self. Um, so this is a faith-based program. Uh, even if you don't have uh, problems with addiction, maybe you have, um, you know, you're struggling with anxiety or depression or something like that. This is a good place to be. Uh, this is, like I said, it's a faith-based program. So it's essentially a Bible study. The, uh, the, the title, New Thirst, is uh, kind of a play on words to deal with uh, both drinking uh, and also, you know, desiring something new in your life. Uh, because everything that we try to do to satisfy, you know, our needs or to make things better uh, always tend to make it worse because um, they're not focused on God. And so this is a thirst for something new, uh, something life-changing, something better, something more. The church that uh, I attend now calls the same program something more. The New Thirst is the title that uh, or the name that came off of a program um, from the same group of churches, both Calvary Chapel churches, uh, but in a different town. So, uh, welcome. Um, if you're just now joining us again for the first time, I recommend going back to the previous videos. I've got all the videos um, lined up on my channel in a playlist, um, so you can start from the beginning. I have, and I, I don't have. I'm not caught up to where we are now. I'm probably five lessons behind, uh, or maybe even more. Uh, but you can go to the website www.soberforchrist.com and look up the um, PDF files. Uh, that follow along with the curriculum. This is not something that I made up. Again, it's a curriculum that was created by the Calvary Chapel Association of Churches. Um, you can go to the website uh, and print up, uh, look up and print off the PDF files. And then that way uh, you can kind of follow along. There's questions on there and, and, and having it in front of you, uh, something that you've printed off. And, you know, there's a lot of spots on there where it'll ask questions or it'll just tell you to write a verse. <laughs> and that's good because the more times that you write the verses down, the more times that you read the verses and study the verses, the, the easier it is to commit it to memory. It helps you to commit it to memory. And, um, but you can follow along and you can have something to, you know, follow along with for, uh, or to read and review for the, the rest of the week until the next lesson. Um, once we finish with this, I'm just going to start over. This takes about a year to go through the whole entire program. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so we're in chapter four. Um, Oh, one more thing before I get started. Uh, as always, if you or somebody you know needs uh, uh, or would like to request a paper Bible, please send me an email. I'll put the contact information in the description below. You can go to the website um, and uh, fill out the contact form. Uh, and all, also on the website, there uh, I think there's some other helpful information. There's a Calvary Chapel Church Finder on there and an AA uh, Meeting Finder. I haven't gone out to see, and I'm sure that there is a, a, a Narcotics Anonymous uh, Meeting Finder to put on there just, you know, uh, in case there's not a faith-based program uh, in your area. And if you need help finding a church or a program, contact me and I will help you with that. Okay, now we're going to get started. So we're in chapter four, uh, and this whole entire chapter is uh, based out of the book of James. And the book of James is a, uh, a book of action. It's a book of doing. In fact, one of the titles for one of the lessons in this chapter is uh, to be doers and not hearers only. So this is a, this is a book of action. It's a call to action. Um, we've talked about how faith without works uh, is dead. We've talked about... Um, well, the next lesson is going to be perseverance through prayer. Um, we've we've talked about uh, 
sorry, we've talked about uh, getting godly wisdom and just being doers of God's word. Uh, the next chapter, we're going to get into um, spiritual warfare. Uh, we've got one more lesson after this. Like I said, uh, it's perseverance through prayer, and then, we, then we're going to get into the spiritual warfare, which is really what the battle is. It's spiritual warfare. All of this has kind of been leading up to this chapter on spiritual warfare. Um, that's, that's the big deal. We get the trials and the temptations, um, and that becomes, it becomes a spiritual battle. Um, so in this lesson, we're going to be talking about pride versus humility. James chapter 4, verse 6 says, But he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. All right, Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18, uh, in the New Living Translation, reads, Pride goes before destruction, and haughtiness before a fall. Those who listen to instruction will prosper, but those who trust the Lord will be joyful. And that's Jeremiah 17, 7 in the NLT. So there's, there's two different verses here, and I don't actually know why um, I even did it this way. This is how it was written up in the curriculum. But this is a different verse. This is a separate verse uh, from this top half here. Uh, so two different verses. The first is uh, Proverbs 16. Pride goes before destruction. So when there's going to be destruction, it's because pride comes out. Pride comes in and then uh, we're going to get knocked down. I know personally um, that uh, a lot of the times that I've slipped up, stumbled, and fell down, smacked myself in the face uh, has been because of pride. It's been uh, thinking that I... You know, I had something to do with anything that was going on, and, and we don't, because the reality of it is we're not in control of even our next breath, much less anything else. We have our ideas uh, on what we want to do, and we make our plans, but the Lord directs his steps. That's another um, verse that's in Proverbs, in, um, I think it's in Proverbs 17 even. Um, it's in 16 or 17. Um, but uh, man makes his path, or a man man makes his, his plans, but the Lord directs his steps. Um, so we're, and and so we're not in control of anything. God, uh, God is in control of everything. I'm not in control of finishing this video beyond the fact that assuming that my heart keeps beating and I keep breathing, that that's all I can say is that I'm going to finish this video, but I'm not in control of those things. So, um, pride goes before destruction and haughtiness before a fall and haughtiness is just arrogance. Pride and arrogance go hand in hand when you're, when you're proud, you're boasting and you're arrogant. Uh, and these things come before destruction and a fall. Jeremiah seventeen seven, those who listen to instruction will prosper. Those who trust the Lord will be joyful. And we, I, I've talked about this. Um, I think I've talked about it. At least if I didn't, uh, I've really thought about it. Um, but I'm pretty sure I talked about the difference between joy and happiness. Um, in one of my other videos outside of this curriculum, uh, joy and happiness, while most people believe that they're synonymous and they're close, they are similar, but they're not really necessarily synonymous because happiness comes and goes. Uh, happiness is the fact that you went and bought a brand new car, um, but that that happiness, the, the, the joy, the temporary joy that it gives you, and that's, that's why I say that it's happiness because happiness comes and goes, um, that will eventually wear off. Um, until you get the next car and then you're happy for a little while. And then after that, it's just a car. Uh, the joy comes from the fact that you have a car period. So when we trust in the Lord, we have this joy and the joy comes from the hope that we have in the Lord, in Jesus, by the way, when it's, uh, all capitals, uh, L O R D like that, um, that is in reference to the actual name of Jesus, which is Yahweh. And in, uh, the, the, uh, Hebrew, the, um, the scribes, they wouldn't actually write Yahweh. They would just write Y H. Um, yeah, I can't even remember Y H W H, uh, or Jehovah, uh, Y H V H. Um, because they didn't want to use the Lord's name in vain, uh, by writing the whole name. It was too sacred to them, but when it says Lord like this, it's referring to the actual name of, of, of God, Yahweh. Um, so those who listen to the instruction will, uh, instruction will be joyful in Yahweh. And that joy is something that doesn't go away. And so there's a joy that you have all the time, even in trials and temptations. Uh, even when things aren't going your way, you have the joy that comes from the Lord. 
<clears throat> as we've been going through James, um, in every single one of these lessons, we will take out uh, a section of scripture and, uh, in a sense, exposit it. Uh, but we'll we'll kind of go through it. It's not a true exposition of it, but we'll go through it and and look at how it applies to. Uh, the topic that we have at hand, which is in this case, pride and humility. Um, so where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and do not have, you murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight in war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on pleasures. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know the friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealousy? But he, get, <clears throat> sorry, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. And that's James chapter 4, verse 1 through 10. So um, I'm not really going to get into going through all of this right now because we're pretty much, I mean, we're going to start going through it right away um, with some questions and answers and things like that. So in this passage, James teaches us the principle of humility and how this godly attribute is the secret to God's grace. Especially when in trials and temptations, James also teaches that God resists the proud. So a real quick aside here, a little side note. Um, it says, uh, in this passage, James teaches us the principality of humility, which is the opposite of pride, uh, to be humble, and how this godly attribute is the secret to God's grace. Uh, grace and mercy, this is the aside. Grace and mercy, while are also they sound, and most people think that they're the same, they're not necessarily synonymous either. Mercy is not getting something that you deserve. If you go to court for a speeding ticket, um, the mercy is the judge not giving you the penalty uh, that you deserve, which, you know, for like a speeding ticket would be a fine. Uh, grace would be getting something that you don't deserve, which would maybe just be having the whole thing completely dropped. Not only did he give you mercy and not give you a fine, um, he just completely threw the whole thing out for whatever reason. So he gave you something that you didn't deserve. He showed you mercy. Uh, um, and then he, I'm sorry, he didn't give you something that you did deserve, which is the mercy. And then he gave you something that you didn't deserve. Uh, that's the grace. In the case of God, uh, the mercy is shown when he, or the mercy was shown when he sent his son to die on um, the cross. When when Jesus came and died on the cross, that was the mercy because what we deserved was death. And what he is giving us is life. That's the grace. So he's giving. He's not giving us what we deserve. What we deserve is death for our sins. And what he's giving us is eternal life. He's giving us salvation, life in him. Uh, and that is the grace. And in order to have <coughs> one of the secrets anyway, to getting God's grace is to have humility. Uh, because when we're humble, we're not putting emphasis on ourselves. We're giving God all of the glory. Oh man, I've got allergies or something. Um, and you can especially see this in trials and temptations. When we're just glorifying God uh, in the trials and temptations, when we're being humble and giving it to him, when we know that he's going to take care of things, that is when God has the ability to really give us grace um, or really to show us grace in these situations. So let's get into the text. Verse one, where do wars and fights come from? Well, they come from our desires for pleasure that war in our members. That's our members being our, you know, our body parts. Um, the, 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 the desires and the pleasures of the flesh is where wars, uh, wars and fights come from. Nobody's ever gone to war without wanting something that they didn't have. So really, um, these desires for pleasure are self-centeredness, uh, self-seeking selfishness, um, and 
the the lust and covetousness that goes along with it wanting something uh that you don't have and then constantly desiring over something that you don't have which is also both of those well all of those lead to idolatry it's kind of like a web of things that lead up to but covetousness is wanting something that you don't have lust is generally uh, looked at from a uh, um a sexual desire, an extreme sexual desire, but there are lusts. You can't have lust. So not only can you be jealous and want something, you can let it control you and just lust after it and think about it constantly. Uh, and then in, uh, in a roundabout way, that becomes idolatry because you are letting that control your life and it's pushing God out of the way and uh, it's taking precedence where God should be taking precedence. Um, but War, wars and fights come from uh, our desires uh, that pleasure within our members, um, and it, it's self self seeking, uh, selfishness, being self centered, whatever way you want to um, to term that. Uh, it comes from selfishness. Um, in fact, the first sin, and then subsequently, literally all sins after that come from. Uh, some sort of selfishness in one way or another. The first sin was the idea that if you ate of the fruit of the tree, that you could become like God. So you would, you, you could become like God. So that's me being, um, you know, lustful and covetous after something that I don't have. So we had this desire. Well, we didn't, but Eve did. And I can say we, cause really it's all humanity. We still desire to be God. So that's why we create our own gods. Uh, we, we, we put ourselves in a position of Godhood, but anyway, uh, Lee, uh, Eve, you know, saw that the fruit was good and, you know, it was pleasing to the eyes and it had uh, the power to make her wise and make her like God. And that's being selfish. And every sin after that uh, is derived from selfishness. It, uh, everything from from murder down to, you know, stealing um, a Sharpie from work. I mean, uh, that's all selfishness. So when we don't get what we want, we fight in order to have it. War comes when we covet and envy what others have uh, or when we want our own way. It's pride. Every war that has ever been fought ever has been fought on the basis of pride, wanting something that you don't have or thinking that uh, your way is better than their way or um, thinking that, well, yeah, no, thinking that you know best, thinking that uh, you need to impose your will on other people. So we have this pride because we want things our own way instead of thinking of what would be best uh, for the others. Like, uh, let's look at World War II. That's an extreme example um, because of the Holocaust, but Hitler did what he thought was best. He was prideful, did not like the Jews, and went, sought to exterminate the Jews, not thinking about the what was best for everybody. It was what was best for him. It was, it was all a selfish. He was a little man he had little man syndrome. It was all selfishness and uh, pride that, that, um, fueled that war. Uh, and there were a lot of people in Nazi Germany, uh, that followed the same ideas, but that was all because of selfishness and pride. We can get rid of these people and we can be the supreme race. We are the Aryan race. We are the supreme race, pride and self-centeredness. James chapter four, verses two and three say this, you have not because you do not ask or you ask amiss. In other words, the things we desire, which is pride, should actually be a matter of prayer. We should be praying about these things uh, and not praying that God will give us. He's not a magic genie that's just going to give us whatever we want. That's not what this is saying. You know, it does say you have not because you ask not. But when you're not asking in faith, you're not going to receive. And if it's contrary to God's will, we're not going to receive. And we have to remember that one, no is always an answer. And two, again, God is not our magic genie just to give us whatever we want. He knows what's best for us. And so as long as our prayer aligns up with his will, then we will have. We need to make sure that we allow God to make the decision whether or not to satisfy that desire or not try to force it. We have a habit as humans, because we're selfish and prideful, to try to force things. You know, I prayed about this, but I didn't get an answer on it, so I'm just going to go ahead and see if I can figure out a way to do it anyway. I don't know. Maybe it's maybe it's buying a vehicle. You, uh, you don't necessarily have the money to put on the down payment, and your credit's not as good as it's been, and you've been praying to God because you really want this car, but you know he hasn't provided any extra money for the down payment or whatever the case may be, and so we try to force it, and it usually backfires and explodes in our face. Um, 
we need to make sure that we're allowing God to uh, run our lives <coughs> and uh, to make the decisions as to whether or not to satisfy this desire or to replace or deny it. That's the humility. That's the being humble, knowing that God knows what's best for us. And when it says we have to use human terms to uh, describe what God does, but we know, well, I know, uh, and if you're a Christian and you study the Bible, then you know and we know as Christians that um, God is all-knowing. So he's not up there like making a choice like, oh, man, he really, he's really wanting this. He's been praying about it for, you know, two weeks and just all day long he prays and he's like lord if it's just please let me have this i really want this um that's not he's not going to change his mind or make a decision but when we align god does desire that we uh that we pray to him that's the highest form of worship is prayer seeking his will and when we seek his will then uh things will line up as long as we are aligned with his will but it comes down to humility again knowing that he knows what's best for us. Uh, James talks about friendship with the world in verse four. If you are a friend of the world, what are we to God? And the answer is an enemy of God. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. And that word uh, enmity um, <clears throat> definition is a state or feeling of being actively opposed or hostile to someone or something. So um, if we are friends with the world, then we are opposed to or hostile towards God. Uh, and if we want to be a friend of the world, then we make ourselves an enemy of God. We cannot serve both. You cannot serve God and mammon. We cannot have uh, we cannot serve God in a spiritual way, sense and serve the world or be a slave to the world um, and I'll expect things to go right with God. It's not going to happen. We can't have it both ways. I took a quick second because I wanted to look this up because I couldn't remember it. But um, you cannot serve God and mammon. That's Matthew 6, 24. It says, no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despises the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Uh, you cannot serve God and wealth. Um, basically, uh, that's what mammon is as well. So you cannot, it's, it's car, carnal things, things of the flesh. Um, you can't have two masters. You cannot, whatever you worship is what you're a slave to. So you can either worship the world and you can be a slave to sin in the flesh, or you can be a slave uh, to God. Well, I don't want to be a slave to God because, uh, well, one, we were created, um, to be his servants. Uh, first of all, that's what he desires for us and being a slave to the world. Well, we're in an addiction class. So how has, uh, been being a slave to the world and being a slave to sin been going for us? Uh, for me, it wasn't very good. I know for a fact that being a slave to the world was not going good for me at all. Um, and so that's why I finally decided to turn my life uh, back over to God because I spent about 15 years um, not anywhere near him. Um, but anyway, we can't love the world. Because <coughs> if we love the world, then we're, uh, we're an enemy of God. We have, to, we have to pick. We have to choose one. Um, and, and like I said, being, being selfish and being in the world... Uh, that's not going very well for us, and that's why we're here. Um, so, so it's best, and we talk about this at the very beginning in the very first lesson. Uh, there's a couple of bullet points that talk about um, getting rid of old friendships and old relationships, changing the type of music that we listen to, the te the television that we watch, uh, maybe even as far as changing our work environment, if it's a, a work environment that's conducive to whatever sort of an addiction that we're in, um, changing everything about it so that we can be focused on God and draw closer to him as opposed to staying in the world. Uh, because staying in the world, has it's literally killing us. Uh, sin brings on death, and so being out there is literally killing us. First John chapter 2, verse 15 and 16 explains what it means to be a friend of the world. Verse 15 says, Do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. 
For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. So we get a very cl clear picture of what being in the world is. If we have the love of the or if we love the world, then the love of, of the Father or the love for the Father is not in us. We cannot love the world and love God. And if we're loving the world, God still loves us, but he can't love us because we're in the world and we're pushing him away. We're literally denying him. We're rejecting him for the world. Uh, and to force us to do anything, that's not love. Um, and all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Uh, these things are not from the Father. These things are from the world. These are of the flesh. These are of our carnal nature. Worldliness begins in the heart and is characterized by three attitudes. The lust of the flesh, hmm, well, lust of the fleas, uh, the lust of the flesh, which is gratifying our physical desires. The lust of the eyes, which is coveting and accumulating things or materialism. Because uh, we see things and we want them. That's lust. That's the lust of the flesh. Uh, and lust and covetousness are closely related. Because if we're jealous over something, if we're coveting something, eventually we're going to, uh, to lust after it. Um, and it's all material uh, earthly based things that are going to rust and rot and not follow us into heaven. Uh, we can't take things with us. Uh, and then number three is the pride of life, uh, which is the obsession with one's status or importance. Um, all of these things deal with pride and covetousness and lust. We see somebody else's status, we want it, uh, and we desire to be uh, the best, you know, we want to be the president of, you know, the group of the club. We want to, um, you know, become the boss. We aren't satisfied with just being a servant in the church. Even we want that pastor status. Um, and you know, some of us are called to, uh, to be pastors and teachers. And so the desire to do those things, um, is not abnormal. It's when you make it, um, a prideful thing and a covetous thing as opposed to just serving God where he's got you until the time arises <coughs> and you're ready and get put into one of those positions, which by the way, in, I can't remember if it's first or second Timothy. Um, there's a scripture when it's talking about the qualifications for pastors and overseers and, and deacons and things like that. Um, it says that uh, he must not be a novice lest he get puffed up. So there's a certain amount of humility that comes along uh, with the opportunity to get into a pastor role or a teacher role within a church uh, because otherwise the pride will come um, because of status. Look at me. I'm the pastor. When the reality of it is uh, to be a pastor is and a minister, to minister is to serve. Um, so when you become a pastor, you just really become a servant. Uh, and, and, and a lot of people think that the pastor should be, um, you know, being served by the church. But the opposite is true. It's the pastor's job to serve the church, to serve the body. That is his job. But we look at this from a prideful perspective and say, ha, look at me, I'm the pastor. Um, and we do this. I mean, that's our human nature in life is we want to have that higher status uh, or importance so we have the lust of the flesh our physical desires the lust of the eyes coveting and uh, uh, um, accumulating physical things things that don't matter we should not want to continue to have more i mean there's nothing wrong with wanting um you know a house with a roof that doesn't leak and doesn't have mold growing in the walls there's nothing wrong with wanting um a vehicle that gets better gas mileage or a you know whatever the case may be the reality of it is, though, is we're not ever satisfied. We always are going to want something more. <coughs> and like I said, there's nothing wrong with it as long as we don't let it dominate our life and become covetousness. You know, it's not all we're thinking about and all we're striving for. We need to put our trust in God, humility. We need to um, know that God is going to uh, take care of us, watch over us, and provide for us the things that we need, humility. And we need to know that there's nothing in our life that we're in control of. Like God can say yes or no, and we're not in control of our next breath. Humility. So we have the lust of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life or the pride of status. 
James chapter 4, verse 5, in essence, says that the spirit uh, that is in us is jealous concerning our love. The spirit, that being the Holy Spirit, is jealous of our love. He's a jealous God. It says this in the Old Testament in several places. For your God, he said, obviously it's speaking to the Israelites, but it doesn't matter. It's the same God. Do not have any idols before me. Do not make yourself idols. Do not worship other idols because your God is a jealous God. God doesn't want us to have any other love. He doesn't want us to have any other idols that would take away or distract uh, from our love for him. And that is the, the definition uh, literally of idolatry is to love something more than you love Jesus oh, and love it so much that it det or or to love it so much that it detracts from your love for Jesus. Uh so do you not know, or do you think, this is uh, James 4, 5, do you think that the scripture says in vain, uh, like that it says wrongly, that it just says, you know, for no reason, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealousy. It doesn't say that in vain. It Because like I said, in multiple places in the, in the Bible, it says that God is a jealous God. Um, and we are, again, commanded to not have any idols before him to not have any other gods it's common misconception um, for a lot of people that uh, you know gods are something that you worship it's a statue that's on you know your fireplace mantle or you know a totem pole or something like that but that's not the case it's it's anything um, it's anything that takes away uh, takes your attention away from God this electronic device can in a sense become a god when you give it more attention uh, than you give to the god the yahweh um, of the bible when it gets more of your attention it gets it, it gets more worship and that's that's turning it into a god it doesn't like i said have to be a statue something that you carved out or you know some piece of pottery or something like that uh so uh, if we're tempted what does james 4 seven through eight say about this it says submit to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners and purify your hearts. You double minded. So when we are tempted, we are to turn to God. If we resist the devil, if we turn to God, he will flee from us. Light and darkness cannot dwell together. Um, you either have dark or you have light, but you can't have both. The devil is darkness. If you invite God in, if you're falling into temptation, if you're starting to have these intrusive thoughts and Satan's kind of creeping his way into your thoughts and you start having these temptations, resist the devil. Call on the Holy Spirit. Call on the name of Jesus. Ask the Holy Spirit to fill you. Ask Jesus to fill you with the Holy Spirit and flee from the devil and fill yourself with the Lord and the darkness will flee because you cannot have light and darkness in the same place. They cannot exist. They are, in fact, mutually exclusive. You either have light or you have dark. Verses 11 through 12 of James chapter 4 say this. Do not speak evil of one another, brethren. He who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and destroy. Who are you to judge another? Uh, there was um, a couple of lessons ago. We talked about bridling the tongue and how the tongue is untamable. There's a very small organ in our mouth uh, that can get us into a lot of trouble. Um, and uh, James says that he who can control the tongue is essentially a perfect person. Um, the tongue is essentially untamable, and we should not speak evil of someone else because when we do, we are judging them. What we need to do is come alongside of a brother and lift them up and not speak evil of them, not blaspheme them, because otherwise, or not blaspheme them, not gossip, uh, gossip about them, not trash talk about them, because that is that is passing a judgment. And if you uh, speak evil of the law, you judge the law. Uh, we would not know sin without the law. The sin does not give us salvation, uh, but the sin allows, or the law allows us. Did I just say the sin does not give us salvation? Uh, the law does not give us salvation. Um, 
Without the law, we would not know sin. The law is there so that we know sin. So if we judge the law because we're judging our brother, then we're not a doer of the law, but we're a judge. And there is only one judge, and that is Jesus, because the only person that can judge you is your master. Servants are only responsible to their masters. Who are you to judge another man's servant? Um, this is biblical. Um, I think it's in Romans. I don't have that off the top of my head, but it is not biblical to judge another man's servant. Uh, and since God is the only judge and we're servants to God, who is any man to cast judgment um, as far as the law goes and the law not being our human law, the law being the law of God. Verse number 12 says there is one lawgiver who is able to save and destroy. The lawgiver is God. Who are we to judge another? Verse 11 and 12 James tells us not to speak evil or judge another. Um, how could this be prideful? Because <clears throat> if we're judging somebody, then we're then in essence saying that we are perfect. Um, multiple times in the gospel or uh, in the gospels in the New Testament, um, there's a parable about making sure to take the plank out of your own eye. Um, actually, I think it's one of them is in Matthew 7, uh, because that's actually Matthew 7, 1 says, judge not. Uh, verse 2 says, lest you be judged. Um, and I'm pretty sure, so then it's in Matthew 7, it's also in Mark, uh, to make sure that you take the plank out of your own eye before you search for the speck in your brother's eye. Uh, that becomes prideful because we're pointing out something uh, in somebody else without acknowledging our own problems. And so we're putting ourselves up, we're raising ourselves up like we're at some sort of a status, remember, um, that is the pride of life seeking to have some higher elevated status, uh, when in fact we are just as guilty of breaking the law as anyone else. If you have broken one part of the law, if you have trespassed against one part of the law, you are guilty of the whole law. So we are just as guilty as everybody else and we are not in any place to pass judgment on someone. There's a difference between passing judgment and uh, calling out sin. We're not the sin police, but in your brothers, it is important to bring sin to light, uh, not for condemnation, but for conviction and for correction. By, and that's not judgment. There's a difference there. Oh, uh, here it is. It is in, it's in Romans. Um, uh, <coughs> sorry, I didn't realize it was in here. Well, I should have known it was in here since I prepared all this, but I guess I forgot. James 4.12 says, there is one lawgiver who is able to save and destroy. Paul says in Romans 14.4, 4, who are you to judge another man's servant? Before his own master, he either stands or falls. We cannot judge another man's servant. Uh, therefore, we cannot judge humans because we're all servants of God. Uh, it is God who we either accept or reject what we're doing. So to be a judge of another man's servant is wrong. Judge not. That's Matthew 7, 1. Don't speak evil of another, because if you speak evil, evil, then you are judging your brother. And again, make sure to examine the plank in your own eye before you look at the speck in your brother's eye. And I know we're at 38 minutes. We're almost done. We've got um, this slide and two more. James chapter 4, verse 13 through 17 says this. Come now, you who say tomorrow, oh, I'm sorry, today or tomorrow, we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. See here it says, to be haughty, boasting, arrogant, these are evil things. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him is a sin. Uh, but you can see clearly in these verses... Um, that James is writing here, uh, why are we going to say that we're going to go do this or go do that when we're not in control of anything? We should just let the Lord guide us and lead us. Again, we make our plans, but the Lord directs our steps. James is talking about people are setting out their plan for life, not taking into consideration the Lord's will. This kind of pride can lead to our downfall. And I have watched it happen in my own life where I knew that I should be following God. Being a Christian, you can't avoid it. You're going to get punished for it one way or another. I knew that I needed to be seeking God's will in my life, and I avoided it, and I did what I wanted, and it never once turned out good. Like, you think you'd learn the indefinition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. I apparently, um, up until just a few months ago, uh, did not learn. Um, 
because nothing ever went right. I just kept doing the same thing. Uh, so what should be our attitude towards the things that we do? We ought to say, if the Lord's will, uh, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that, do whatever it is. Uh, that's what our attitude should be. We can make our we can make our plans, we can have our ideas, but it all needs to come into play according to uh, God's will. All right, and finally, according to verse 16, what is boasting? Uh, verse 16 says, but now you boast in your arrogance, all such boasting is evil. Boasting is arrogance, boasting is being arrogant, and boasting is evil. Being puffed up, talking good about yourself, that's being prideful, that is evil. So that's the difference between uh, pride and humility. Pride is being puffed up. Look at me, look at me, look at me. And humility is saying, you know what? I have nothing. I am nothing without God. Without the love of Jesus and the blood of the cross, I am nothing and I am doomed. I am destined to an eternity of pain and suffering instead of an eternity with Jesus. Boasting is a type of pride that is rude and has empty assurance. It trusts in its own power and resources, shamefully despises and violates God's laws and others' needs. Boasting is an empty presumption that trusts in the stability of earthly things. God wants us to look to him for guidance in everything. Uh, we can see that in James 4.15, um, where it says, Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. We should do everything according to the Lord's will. As we do this, we will see that he is the one doing great things in our lives, not ourselves. We need to humble ourselves before God, laying aside our pride and worldly desires with willing and obedient hearts. Having a humble heart, God will give us grace when it comes to trials and temptations. He will lead us out of these. He will show us grace. He will give us grace and, and, and ultimately keep us from going back to where we were as long as we're humble and call on him when we're in a trial when we're in a temptation uh, this is an addiction class so uh, when we fall into temptation when we start having you know ideas of that drug or that drink or that website or something like that we need to call on God humble ourselves and realize that we can't do it ask him to take the temptation away from us uh, as opposed to just going around all day white knuckle in it that's what the 12-step programs tell you to do just white knuckle it doesn't matter just live for this second just this second i'm going to be sober just for the next second i'm going to be sober for the next minute it's just for right now and that's all you're constantly thinking about is just right now because you don't have any control over it all you can do is sit there and think and you just sit there and you dwell on it just right now just right now just right now and i don't know how many times in the past that I'd sit there and say, just right now, I'm not doing it. And so I, I held that off for about six hours. And the next thing I knew, I was doing the thing that I didn't want to do anymore uh, because I was out of control of it and I wasn't giving it to God. Now, when I um, when I got my act together and I started putting my, my faith and my trust in the Lord and started uh, praying for things and, and um, relying on him to take me out of temptation. I'd fall into that temptation and I would literally hit my knees and pray, assuming I was home, um, hit my knees and pray, get my Bible out and start reading, ask for the Holy Spirit to fill me. And every single time it has been there to deliver me from that temptation, humility and realizing that we are not on our own. That's it for this lesson. Uh, here's the contact info, the sober Christian 22 at gmail.com, the website, www.soberforchrist.com and the Facebook group. Uh, feel free to join the Facebook group. It's a private group and I kept it kind of private so that there would be, you know, if somebody wanted to share a story or something like that. It wasn't necessarily out there for the whole world to hear. Although really the only thing that gets posted on there is, um, biblical inspirational quotes from, you know, Charles Spurgeon or John MacArthur or, or uh, something like that, or uh, or Bible verses, um, daily devotions. Uh, that's what gets put on there a lot of the time. Um, but you're welcome to go and join. Everyone's welcome. Uh, it doesn't take anything to get in. Um, pretty much all you have to do is um, send a request, and we're going to let you in. Uh, and so, uh, so yeah. It, again, if you need to. Need prayer, need help finding a church, need help finding a program, um, would like to request a Bible, uh, contact me in the email, go to the website, fill out the contact form, um, whatever you desire to do. The website's a little bit out of date. It's been 
Uh, it's been a couple of months since I've updated it and put any videos on it, but uh, I do work for myself and this is the busy time of the year for me and I just haven't had time. I try to stay on top of it um, and I'm trying to get all of the um, PDF files loaded up onto it. I have to type them up because when I scan them, they come in super grainy and unreadable. So I have to literally retype everything uh, and create a PDF file to get it on the website. But my goal is to get all that out there so that it's there and it's open for anyone to be able to pull off and use uh, and study. Um, so that's it for this week's uh, lesson. And uh, I will definitely try to get uh, the the next week's up on uh, Sunday. So there's these two are going to be kind of close, but that's okay. I want to get back on track because um, we're probably a total of two months behind through everything that's happened, Christmas, New Year's, um, and then just, you know, with work picking up and being busy and out of town and stuff like that, we're probably about two months behind off of schedule. But I want to get back so we can get this, uh, just keep going on this. So um, that's it for this. And if, uh, <coughs> again, if you need anything, contact me in email. And until the next lesson, stay grounded, stay in God's word, and have a great day.